Having completed our lesson on functions and their inverses, we're now going to look at how to graph radical functions. And we're going to build this on the idea that a radical function is the inverse function of a square or cube operation. So we're going to get to the point where we're going to graph y equals the square root of x, but the parent graph that this comes from is y equals x squared. Now in order to build y equals x squared, we're going to need to be able to have a table of values. So standard x, y here, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, but this graph is symmetric about the y-axis, so it's actually plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. Now, putting these points on our graph, we're going to come out with the following. We have our points at the origin. We have 1, 1 and negative 1, 1, 2, 4, and a negative 2, 4. Now, if we were to graph, connect the lines here and graph this, we end up with the function of our standard quadratic. In order to get the inverse operation, which is y equals square root of x, we're going to take our x and y values and trade them. So we have 0, 0, 1, plus or minus 1, 2, sorry, not 2, 4, plus or minus 2. So that gives us points at the origin here and here, here and here, and you end up with a graph that is a parabola on its side. The problem with this graph is it does not pass the vertical line test and therefore is not a function. In order to make it so that we can treat uh, radicals as functions, we're going to restrict the domain sorry, restrict the range of our original function, y equals x squared, and work with the function that results from that restricted domain. So, in other words, we're going to get rid of the left branch of our original function, and that allows us to get rid of the bottom branch of our inverse. So you end up with a graph that looks like this in the red. It starts at the origin, and whatever x is, y is the square root of that function. Now the functions for radicals are built off of a premise similar to the format for a vertex form of the quadratics. And a lot of the translations and alterations to the graphs are the same. So we're going to start with the parent function, y equals square root of x. But in order to get a full graph of the square root functions, it's y equals a square root of x minus h plus k, where a acts as our vertical stretch, and we have an origin at the point h, k. This is where our graph is going to be built from, and it will behave and look a lot like the graph that we just did. So, we're going to graph a series of functions here on this page just to see what they look like. We're going to start in the first grid with our y equals square root of x. So we have the point zero, 0, as our starting, and we have 1, 1, and 4, 2. Now if we could get out to it, we would have 8, 3, but that's going to be just beyond the reach of the graph, and we have a function that looks like this. So what happens if we have y equals 2 times the square root of x? So we're going to start at the same point at the origin, but all of our output values will be doubled. So instead of 1, 1, we have 1, 2. Instead of 2, 4, sorry, 4, 2, 
we would have 4, 4. And then instead of going out to 8, 3, we would have 8, 6. And we'd end up with a graph that has a vertical stretch factor of 2. So for y equals the opposite of the square root of x, again we're starting at the origin, and what we're going to do is take the original parent graph, y equals square root of x, and reflect it across the x-axis. So we end up here, here, and here, and we get the same graph, just we're moving down. Now let's start doing some horizontal and vertical translations. For the first graph in our third set, lower left hand corner here, we have y equals the square root of x minus 1. Because this minus 1 is outside of the radicand, it has a vertical effect like the k in our parent function. So we're going to start at 0, negative 1, and follow everything else the same. So we have movement of 1, 1, and then 4, 2. And 8, 3. So we end up with a graph that looks about like this. For the red one, we have y equals the square root of x minus 1. This minus 1 is inside of the radicand, so it's going to have the effect of h. What does it take to make inside of this radicand 0? And the answer is a positive 1. So we are going to start this graph at 1, 1. Sorry, 1, 0. Our k value is 0. And then follow our normal suit. So we move right 1, up 1. If you were to substitute in the value of 2, you would have square root of 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. And then we will have 4, 2 movement. So 4 plus our starting point of 1 is 5. We have the square root of 5 minus 1. 5 minus 1 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So we're going to have a point right here. And this is going to look about like that. So all that the adding or subtracting whether it be inside of the radicand for horizontal movement or outside of the radicand for vertical movement, does it changes our starting points of the graph. And with these, we are having to restrict our domains. We cannot substitute in any value for x that we want like we have with previous graphs and operations. In these, we have to make it so that the lowest value inside of the radicand is 0, and then move out from there. Last set, y equals the square root of x plus 3. Again, this plus 3 is on the outside, so it's going to be a vertical translation. We're going to start at the point 0, 3, and have movements like normal. So if we move right 1 from there, we'll move up 1. If we move right 4, move up 2, right 8, up 3, and we get a graph that grows like this. So let's take all of these and put them together into one place. So our last function, y equals 1 half of the square root of x minus 2 minus 1. We have this minus 2 inside of the radicand, so what does it take to make this value 0? And that would be the value of 2. Now once we have that value of 2, our item outside of the radicand, this minus 1, is the end of our starting point, so we're going to start at 2, negative 1. So move to 2, negative 1, and then we're going to follow what it says for our a value. a is 1 half. So typically, we move right 1, up 1. This time we're going to move right 1, up 1 half. We move right 4 up 2, so we're going to move right 4 up half of 2, which is 2. 
sorry, half of two is one. I knew that sum wasn't right in what I just said. And we have a point here. Then we're going to connect these and get a very gentle rise out of our function. So all the translations that we've learned based on vertex form for either quadratics or absolute value, and then our point-slope form for linears have the same effects when graphing radicals. So how can we use a graph and this graphing ability to solve equations? So let's take the equation y equals 2 times the square root of x plus 3 plus 1 and find out where it is equal to y equals negative 2x plus 7. So our first function, we're going to start at the point that makes inside the radicand 0, which is negative 3, 1. So this will start at negative 3, 1. And have a vertical stretch of 2. So we start at 1. We start here, have a vertical stretch of 2. So we move right 1 up 2, right 4, up 4. Now if we were to move right 8, and up 6. So we end up here. And then connecting our points, remembering that we only grow in one direction. Now, our next graph, y equals negative 2x plus 7, we have a y-intercept of 7, slope of negative 2, so we have points here, 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 and just in moving down the line, connect the points. This graph can go in both directions. Try and graph this as straight as possible. And then where do the points inter the lines intersect each other? And the answer is right here at 1, 5. So that point is the solution to these fun equations and where they would equal one another. Now, there are graphs other than the square root graph, and they will follow a similar set of patterns. So if we work with cube roots, what is the behavior here? Well, when we look at the values for a cube function, you have x and we'll say x cubed. If we have negative 2, you get negative 8. Negative 1 gives you negative 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 8. So when we go to graph at cube roots, we're going to trade these x and y values. So y equals cubed root of x will have the point negative 8, negative 2, then we have the point negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 8, 2. So you end up with a function that looks something like this. Now, working with translations, the behaviors are going to be the same. So y equals 2 cubed root of x plus 1 minus 2. For this radicand, x plus 1, what does it take to make inside of there 0? And it's, the answer is negative 1. And if it's 0, the value outside acts as our vertical translation. So we're going to start at negative 1, negative 2, which is here. Then we have a vertical stretch factor of 2. So normally it's 1 and 1, so it's going to be 1 and 2 and then left 1, down 2. Then it was 8 and 2, so we're going to move out 8 to the right 8 and up 4 to here, and then we'll move left 8 and down 4 to here, just off the graph. Then connecting these points you end up with a function that looks like what's in red. 
our last one, y equals the opposite of the cubed root of x minus 4 minus 1. So what does it take to make inside this radicand 0? And the answer is 4. What does it, if it's 0, what happens out here? We get in minus 1. So we're going to start this graph at 4, negative 1. And with a negative a value, it's going to take what we saw in the blue graph and simply reflect it across that horizontal line. So normally it's right 1, up 1. This time it's going to be right 1, down 1. Left 1 was going down, so left will go up. Then it was moving to the right, 8, which is going to be far off our graph. But if we move to the left, 8, we can move up 2 and end up with the point here. Then connecting this point to the rest of the graph, you end up with what's seen in green. So graphing square roots and cube roots and other roots are going to follow patterns similar to what you've seen here. It's just a matter of learning those patterns and remembering that square roots move in one direction, cube roots will move off in both.